In this conversation, Kathleen Sullivan German shares her expertise in operation and optimization in the e-commerce industry. She discusses her passion for operation and the importance of efficiency in driving profitability. Kathleen explains her typical engagement which involve analyzing and optimizing various aspects of a company operations. Kathleen explains her typical engagements which involve analyzing, optimizing and implementing various aspects of the company's operations. She emphasizes the need for a structured implementation process and the challenges of a change management. Kathleen also discusses the importance of sales and operation planning, SNOP, in aligning departments and improving overall company performance. She highlights the evolving of e-commerce landscape in the adoption of new technologies and data analytics. Kathleen discusses... We've also discussed the importance of product line analysis and the benefits of selling on marketplaces such as Amazon. Kathleen also shares insight and advice on various aspects of brand growth and operation. She discusses the process of launching and protecting a brand on Amazon, a rise of social shopping like TikTok, and the importance of meeting customers where they are. Kathleen also explains the difference between a multi-channel and omni-channel strategies, providing tips for selecting and working with 3PL partners, and discusses the pros and cons of 3PLs versus 4PLs. Tune in to another invaluable episode with one of the industry-leading operation and supply chain experts. Welcome to the Ecom Pulse, your heartbeat to the world of e-commerce. I'm your host, Eitan Kotter. Join us as we meet with industry leaders, marketing experts, and the innovative minds behind the tech that is shaping the e-commerce future. So plug in, gear up, and get ready for a pulse-pounding journey into the heart of e-commerce. Hi, Kathleen. I'm super, super excited. Thank you. Thank you for showing up on my podcast. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Wow, it's really a pleasure to have you. I know we've been uh, discussing quite a while and, um, you know, find, try to find the right time for, for you. I mean, I know you are very, very busy with so many things, right? Not just for your professional work. Uh, so it's going to be an amazing episode. So I really appreciate your time. So let's uh, let's dive in. I mean, please share with us Great. a little bit, you know, about your background, your expertise, and you know, what are you working on these days? Yeah. So um, I'm a mother of five, and that's um, a good start. That's a good yeah. start. Yeah. And it's, I, it's, uh, I do have a life outside of work. My husband and I would <laughs> love to travel. We scuba dive. I like. I would rather be under the ocean than anywhere else. Wow. Um, so we live we live in an area that's pretty landlocked. So we ski mm-hmm. in the winter, and we take trips to go scuba dive. So uh, <laughs> we stay Very pretty nice. active, which is great. great. Um, my background work wise, um, I have been both a founder and a consultant to other founders. I've had uh, some really great companies that had some really good exits. I've had some others that weren't so great, which is I think. You learn more from those than anything else. Um, Correct. And then yeah, I sure. started I started about maybe 15 years ago, 10 to 15 years ago, consulting with other companies and helping other brands learn operations from what I gained in the knowledge of always owning my own brands. And even even with my own brands, my focus has always been that back-end operations side. I'm mm-hmm. a firm believer that sales and marketing will drive your revenue, but operations is going to drive your profit. So those efficiencies are, are, those nice. are my exciting things. Amazing. So, so why, what, what actually got you in operation and why you are still passionate about it after, you know, all these years? You know, I, I love it. I like it. It feels very tidy to me. You go in and, and clean up messes and you create processes and you mm-hmm. organize and you identify areas where a brand could be losing money and they don't even realize it. Um, so for me, it feels very victorious, right? There's, wow. you know, there are yeah. actual tangible things you can do that make a difference. And you know, I think a lot of people don't look at operations like that. They look at, at the sales and the revenue as, you know, that has the big drivers and the big exciting victories and the, uh, you know, they landed a big sale and everybody celebrates and then operations is in charge of making that work. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it really takes both sides working in tandem in order to create that success. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Amazing. And what are you working on? I mean, in, in Sally German, right? And Associates, I know you were consulting for many years and what are the typical engagements? I mean, they're evolving around optimization, you know, working yeah. on different. Op- yeah, yeah, that's a super good question. It, it's kind yeah. of it, it kind of covers a broad range of things depending on what a brand will need. So okay. I've had brands hire me. I had a brand hire me to help them uh, completely redesign their tech stack. 
So they needed a lot more automation. Uh-huh. They, they actually got up to $25 million in revenue, which is incredible. But they were running the entire company on spreadsheets. Even they had their own warehouse and they didn't even have an yeah. WMS in place. So, uh-huh. you know, we went in and, and basically set them up with a really good tech stack so that they could lever up from that $25 million higher. Um, and that was, I think that was probably a six, six, seven month contract. Um, I have others that they just want me to help them find a new 3PL warehouse. Maybe mm-hmm. they've outgrown the one they're in or they're unhappy or they're self-fulfilling and it's time to have, you know, a 3PL with integrations. And so I'll help them. I'll do an RFP and help them find the right fit. Yes. Um, I work for a couple of software companies and, you know, I write content for their websites and kind of take that subject matter expertise so that mm-hmm. the, the software companies that are making software for e-commerce know what the pain points are and what they need to solve. Um, there are a lot of soft, there's a lot of software out there, a lot of choices. And I think it's really important that those companies building those products understand their customer journey and what is happening on that side. I, okay. I read something recently that said that customers don't want to buy a three quarter inch drill bit. They want to buy a three quarter inch hole. <laughs> so you need to sell them the solution, right? You need to yes. sell them yes. the hole, not the drill bit. And yes. I thought, wow, that is such a good analogy because nice. it's true. You know, we, the software companies have to solve the problem, not tell us all about their software. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I'm enjoying that part of the, the journey as well, working on that side. So it really ranges. You know, sometimes I'll go into a I, I just finished a contract with a, a brand that, again, it was similar, you know, lots of spreadsheets, lots of double and triple entry, mm-hmm. lots mm-hmm. of manual processes. So I went in and did an entire analysis and then assigned time values to all of those inefficiencies so that they could see how much time it was taking their staff to do that. And so then I was, all right, how many people do you have doing this? What do they make per hour? Mm -hmm. And we tallied it up. And then that number is the monthly budget for a software and automation to get Uh rid of some of those manual things. And then I'll free up those, those employees to work on other things. Okay, interesting. And when you work with brands, they usually come and say, hey, I have, I need to stop using Excel sheets and I need a, you know, a tech stack. Or it's just, hey, I don't know why I, 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 you know, I'm using profitability or I'm losing market share or like people know what they need to do or just you go there, you need to analyze, of course, research. I think it's in the but middle. It's, it's, in, it's in the middle, yeah. Yeah, I think they don't know what they need. Otherwise, they could just implement it. Yeah. Um, but they know they need something. So usually it's they're noticing that things are taking too long or they're having a real struggle with inventory management. Maybe mm-hmm. they have not enough or too much all the time or their costs are really high for shipping or they're having a really rough relationship with their warehouse and they don't understand why the warehouse just can't get it right. Um, huh. Whereas the warehouse, on the other hand, is could be in a situation where they're like they're not sending us the right in the right format. Right. Mm-hmm. So it could be as simple as figuring that out. So usually it's, they don't know what the problem is, but they know there is a problem. And so then I'll come in and do an analysis. Yes. Um, I had one client that hired me, their operations person wanted to leave and had been there for a number of years. And mm-hmm. so I worked with her on the knowledge transfer, all of the SOPs, all the processes and the logins and everything she was doing to keep things moving. Yep. And I, we documented all of it. And then again, looked for errors of inefficiency, but then I interviewed with the, the CEO for the new person. So I helped her pick the new person based on what I knew about their ecosystem and what they needed in terms of the skill set of the person that they needed to hire. Yes. So I went in there and sort of identified the need, helped offboard the old person, and then helped onboard the new one. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, really it's all over the map, but as long as it's in e commerce operations, supply chain, logistics, it still fits inside my bucket. Yes. So it's, it's tech stack, it's processes, it's staffing, it's everything around, you know, the various things. So, and I know you're very structured and there is a process, right? So you go there, you analyze, you take your time, probably you provide some recommendation. I know you're also involved in the implementation. So how does it look like in terms of, you know, you know the different stages, right, in these various processes? You know, that's a great question. I think that the hardest stage is that first one for when you first walk in the door because they have whatever they have and whatever layer of complexity and whatever mm-hmm. layers of, of manual work, et cetera. And you have to, they have to trust me enough to give me the keys to the whole castle. I can't just get part of it. I have to see everything. I have to see how everything's inter- interrelating to each other. Yes. I need to know how they're doing manufacturing mm-hmm. planning. I need to know how they're doing their financials. I need to know, are they, are they using QuickBooks and 
how much integration do they have? What is automatically connected and what are they doing yeah. manually? What's happening through email? I like to get access to their ops um, mailbox and go through their emails and figure out how mm-hmm. much back and forth is happening with vendors and with warehouses. Wow. So, so really the, the beginning is the hardest part because it's that discovery phase because they don't really know what to show me in order for me to, to do my work. I have okay. to sort of dig through and find it. And so yeah. there's sort of a, a lag at the beginning where there's no, there's no measurable deliverable at, at first because I'm learning. Um, yeah. And trying to understand and trying to identify what they're doing and where the, where their gaps are, and right, and really going, not like, just where the gaps they, are, but yeah. what's going well also. Like what what do I need to not touch because uh-huh. they really have it nailed, right? Yes, and it's a really going deep dive. I mean, like the devil is in the details, right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you gather all the information and try to analyze what's going on. You know, the bad things, the good things, what's working, what's not. Um, and then you go to the next next phase of trying to provide some you know, pro- recommendation or some plan, you know, to yeah, for the so, transformation, so, right? Yeah. So what I'll do at that point is, as you know, I'll come to them with what I've identified so far as far as the inefficiencies, and then we start to tackle the low hanging fruit first, mm-hmm. right? Okay. Let's not jump right into the the biggest, most complicated thing. Let's look for the easy wins and the things that they can solve internally that that can make processes better you know maybe they have two different spreadsheets and they're moving information from one to the other all right let's just do some coding in that second spreadsheet to automate that so that the manual keying is out right um maybe they're doing okay. they're using edi it's called electronic data interchange mm-hmm. and it's what brands yep. will use to sell to large retailers and often a brand will start edi and they'll sign up for the cheapest solution they can and it's all mm-hmm. happens on the web, right? And so they'll go in and they'll receive an order from Target and they'll manually download the purchase order and manually download hmm. the package slip. And then they'll yeah. email those to their warehouse. And then there's a lot of back and forth and back and forth. And then they'll upload that into the, the EDI portal so that Target knows that the product is coming. Yeah. Well, it may seem like that's the least expensive way to do it. But if you think about how many steps, I think I, I tallied it runs as 31 steps to manually do an EDI order. So if you're wow. paying someone $25 31. an hour or more in 31 <laughs> steps, mm-hmm. that order just costs you a lot more money. And if you think about, Let's more. if you look at how many orders you're getting in a month, you now have a budget for your tech stack, right? It's it's yeah. whatever you were paying for that manual work is your new budget to, to automate that process. Interesting, interesting. And you mentioned uh, the the example of you know replacing uh, the head of operation. You were very much involved, obviously, in the job description, the interviewing, maybe the criteria for selection and the implementation. And so, what about uh, like you share with us also some other aspect of implementation, like around the tech stack, around processes? I know you are very much involved in these in these steps as well. I am, and and I I would have to say that is the biggest area where you get blocked. Okay. is right there that going from identification to implementation and it's um i actually did a linkedin post about this last week it's fear-based right that mm-hmm. the, the people that are currently doing all those manual processes or the ceo is they're, they're very comfortable with all of their spreadsheets and all of their manual processes and they're really nervous about what will happen if they aren't doing that because they they feel like they have control over that okay. um, and so it's getting sure. over that hurdle that to figure out what are you afraid of and then addressing that so that it seems less scary to implement something, to implement yeah. technology. Again, kind of that low hanging fruit, you know, bring that down, bring that implementation down to the lowest common denominator of why, right? So you explain, well, say you're a CPG brand and you're, uh, you're using a co-manufacturer to make the, the food product and you're, mm-hmm. you've got all of your raw materials and your ingredients and then they make it and then you ship it to your warehouse. Well, there are a lot of processes that go into that, right? It's not just ordering a finished good and shipping it in and sending it to a warehouse. There's sure. all the raw materials that make the finished good and the packaging and all of that. So mm-hmm. all of those need to be coordinated and organized. And if that's a very, very manual process, you know, maybe they're maybe they're emailing or calling every single ingredient vendor. What's the current price? What's the, you know, what's your availability? You know, send me send me the new information so that we can submit it to the FDA. Et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's that's yeah. there's a lot of manual processes. So the the fear of letting that go is what if we miss something? 
right? What if an ingredient is spoils or, you know, so they, they're, they want to maintain that control with those spreadsheets. However, with the right demand planning solution, it will not just track the finished goods. It'll uh-huh. also track all of those raw materials. And it could let you know, maybe you're about to run out of this product, but you have enough raw materials to make that you had planned to make a different product, but those yeah. raw materials could restock this product faster, mm-hmm. right? So an automated solution that maybe has a little magic of AI in there is going to give you those insights. Nice. And so it's addressing that to take that fear away so that they feel like, oh, if I do this, I'm actually going to have more opportunity to pivot and more opportunity to make changes and more opportunity to be in control and have control. Right now with all the spreadsheets, you really don't have control. But with an automated solution that's pulling it all in from the warehouses and the sales channels, yes. uh, then you know, you have knowledge and yes. knowledge is power, right? Exactly, exactly. And of course, uh, you know, post COVID, you know, people are, you know, companies are, you know, there is an increased competition, shipping costs going up. I mean, look inside their internal processes, trying to, I think it's kind of an inflection point, right? Of moving from manual tasks, manual work to automation. Um, and obviously you mentioned also AI. So where are the areas that you see, you know, automation and maybe you can discuss the AI aspect later of, of you know, really working and how do you see this evolving in 2024? Yeah. So you used, you used one of my favorite fl- phrases, inflection point. Yes. So every company is going to have multiple inflection points. And I had it with my brands too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have a great idea and you start and you, you maybe procure some samples and prototypes and you launch your website and, and maybe do a Kickstarter or something. And then you start to get business. You start to get traction, yep. right? Well, yep. y- you still have all of those manual processes in place that you mm-hmm. started with. But things are going well, right? So you're going to keep <laughs> it up for a bit. You don't want to spend any money on stuff until you know it's going to work, right? Well, you're going to get to that first inflection point, right? Maybe you're fulfilling out of your garage or out of a storage unit, right? So your first inflection point is probably going to be fulfillment, right? You've gotten too big to continue to do it yourself. Mm-hmm. Or maybe the first inflection point is we're doing really well on our own website. We want to launch on Amazon, right? Okay. And so then you have to order more inventory. You have to make sure your UPCs and SKUs are lined up so that mm-hmm. they can be converted to ASINs. Um, so that can be an inflection point, adding channels, adding more sales channels. Maybe your warehouse is way overloaded with, with all of your stuff and you're doing really well, but you need to add a warehouse, right? There's another inflection point. So mm-hmm. each time where you run up against something where you're hitting the limits of where you're at yes. or you're, you're creating your own chaos, mm-hmm. that's where your next inflection point is. And you'll have them layered throughout the business. You'll, you'll continue to hit inflection points. And so yes. you can't get complacent, right? You have to mm-hmm. be looking for those areas where you are creating your own chaos. And when it starts to feel a little chaotic, when your ops people start to get a little burned out, your customer service people are hearing the same things over and over and over again. Um, as far as customer complaints, that's an inflection point. You have yes. to make changes at that point. Interesting. Interesting. So about SN- SNOP, right? As an operation planning, I mean, what are the bottlenecks or, you know, some of the you know pitfalls that you see in this process and <laughs> what for you will be an ideal process as well? So um, all the CEOs out there, I'm sorry, because I'm going to say, I'm going to throw you under the bus. You are the inflection or you are the bottleneck. The bottleneck. The CEOs are. They, <laughs> okay. they want to, they, they, they so desperately want to maintain control and they, they uh-huh. had their idea, their business idea. Right. And yeah. so they want to be Maybe. involved in absolutely everything. They want to be, they want to have the final say on everything. You've given all of your people a ton of responsibility without any authority. <laughs> And the CEO, the, the founder, is actually going to burn out because they are trying to drive the company forward, but they're also trying to manage every single department, which doesn't make yeah. any sense. And if you look at a lot of companies, if, you, if I will ask them, hey, you know, give me, give me your organizational chart. And it'll be traditional, vertical, here's the finance department, and here's yes. sales and marketing, and mm-hmm. here's operations. And then customer service is sitting out there, out there by themselves, right? They don't, really don't belong in any bucket. Um, and the CEO sits at the top of all of it, right? That's traditional. Well, if you look at that, it creates silos between each of those departments to do that. Nobody's talking to anybody else. Mm-hmm. So what happens is cost of goods gets out of control. Inventory demand planning is completely off. You have too much or too little inventory. Yep. The CEO is burning out because they're, they're having to make every single decision. So SNOP is sales and operations planning. And what it does is aligns all of those departments together. 
and here I'm making a circle. Um, mm -hmm. It is a circle. So basically sales is going to work with operations. So operations knows how much inventory needs to be ordered. Operations is going to work with finance to let them know how much everything's going to cost. Uh, finance is going to come back to sales with here's your minimum sell price based mm -hmm. on cost of goods, right? To maintain mm -hmm. that profitability. So they're all working in tandem with each other and customer service sits in the middle of the circle. They yeah. know everything. They know why the price is the way it is. They know how we ship. They know how much inventory is in stock. They know what, what the big sales promotions are that are coming down the line that are coming up in another month or so that they can be ready, right? Cause they're going to mm -hmm. have a huge rush of stuff. They need to know if you're, if you're onboarding a new warehouse because that might increase their customer service request. Um, you're onboarding a new vendor. They need to know in case it increases warranty requests, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. the, the customer service, rather than being out there by themselves, I like them to be the heart and soul of the company. And I don't think you should hire the cheapest person you can find for that. You need okay. someone that, that can be the heart and soul and can interact with all those departments and gather information proactively. Mm -hmm. And with a really good SNOP process, a company will meet weekly with their operations and their sales and their customer service team, just brief stand up for 20 minutes. And then monthly, a much bigger one where you're going through spreadsheets and you're analyzing promotions and you're analyzing the demand planning and the, and the finances and mm -hmm. where you are with your funding. And uh, so you're looking at all of that on a monthly basis and doing minor corrections all the way along the line rather than hitting one of those inflection points and having to make major corrections. So yes. with an SNOP, the company just works better. Um, it's also better for the employees because they are talking to each other more. They're having more interaction, more ideas, more brainstorming. They feel more invested in the company and its success. And then the CEO who used to manage every department and every decision is now overseeing the whole thing. And they are free to drive the company forward. New business ideas, fundraising, whatever it is that they need to do, even yeah. PR. I, I worked with a company once and the CEO was a, just a media darling. Everybody wanted to interview her and she was great at it. Um, mm -hmm. But when she was so busy in the day to day, she didn't have time. Didn't have time right? yeah. So you, so you release that CEO to do what they do best. Yes. Yes. I mean, it sounds a amazing process and definitely the right way to go, but what are the major challenges that you find, you know, by implementing this type of process, assuming everyone are, happy which is not the case obviously you know there are people yeah. who are objecting obviously you know job protection and all so you know I, mean, I think i think the biggest challenge with snop is each department wanting to maintain control and wanting to hold everything to sure. themselves yeah you know where, where sales doesn't want to give all of everything over to operations because what if they're wrong and what if operations orders too much inventory and then sales gets in trouble right yeah and maybe yeah. operations you know, they're nervous about reporting to finance because maybe they were really late in ordering a whole bunch of stuff and had to pay for huge shipping fees to rush something. They're going to have to tell someone. They're going to have to tell finance and it's going to impact yeah. cost of goods. So they're, mm -hmm. they're feeling nervous about that, right? And so there are opportunities here for everything to be aligned and people to communicate and work better if they just release. You know, let go of the control. Again, the fear, the fear base. Let yep. go of your fear for how it will look and work together. If they're working together, then sales and, and marketing are telling ops what's about, to, what's about to happen. Ops is in charge of getting the right inventory in with a long tail so they're not spending a lot of money on shipping, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're giving cost of goods to finance because they're able to have more time to figure it out, right? And then finance can be in charge of that big picture and make sure that everything's profitable. And they're going back to sales going, okay, so for the next one, the next retailer you onboard, we need to increase our wholesale price slightly because mm -hmm. our cost of goods went up. Mm -hmm. um, so if they just let go, you know, of the yeah. fear a little bit and work together, it's, yes. you know, it's, it's actually, you have a more safety in your job rather than less Yes, because you're, it's more visible that you're doing a good job. Well, Hey, I mean, it's, it's a big, uh, it's a big change. It goes down to the company culture, you know, the way it things is. are working. Yeah. It's, um, you took a big, uh, task right on your shoulders. So it's not, uh, not a straightforward, it's very challenging, right. I believe to implement, but if. I mean, if their pains are there and there's a willing to make a change, and obviously, you know, with all these new tech tools and, you know, AI coming in, automation, obviously, I mean, there, it's a necessity these days, right? Because, yeah. you know, I mean, I talk to brands and it's a different environment right now, um, you know, with increased competition, cost of shipping is going up, 
Um, <laughs> advertising is, you know, becoming very, very challenging. Or right? look at Timu and all just buying all the inventory out there in terms of advertising. And I mean, it's from every angle, both from the marketing aspects, operational aspect, it looks more challenging. What is your view, I mean, general about e-commerce, right? You know, for 2024, how do you see this evolving? What are the major, let's say, things that brands need to take care both on the back end side and also maybe on the front end side? Yeah, you know, I, I would say don't be afraid of technology. You know, technology is mm -hmm. changing. Um, there are so many companies out there trying to solve your problems. And the majority of them were founded by someone that was an operator and understood yeah. that there was a problem and decided mm -hmm. they needed to fix it themselves whether it's a 3PL that was founded by someone who owned brands and we're like, mm -hmm. now I know what, what we need to do, or whether it's somebody that's doing demand planning software or, um, or an, an AI insights and, and data analytics software that was created by somebody who founded a brand. Yes. Um, all of those things I think are going to bubble to the forefront in 2024. Mm -hmm. and, and they have been advancing over the last couple of years. However, I do think that brands are, are more kind of tightening their belts on what they're spending on some of those things. And the, yes. so they're, again, it's that fear. They have a little more anxiety about taking on something new and implementing it. So from the software perspective, the, the software companies are going to have to show the brands the three quarter inch hole, not the drill, right? They're going to have yes. to show that they can solve the problem. Um, and, and even warehouses, I'm always saying a warehouse is not your vendor. Your three, your third party logistics warehouse mm -hmm. is not your vendor. They are your partner. Yeah. They're the last people to touch your product before your customer gets it. So creating a really strong relationship with your 3PL is critical. They sure. are not your vendor. They don't just work for you, right? There, there's a yeah. level of respect that goes back and forth between the two entities that is really important to the success for both. Yes. So I think we're going to see it moving more towards relationship building in mm -hmm. that, whether it be warehouses or whether it be software or even brands to their customers. Um, everybody wants to feel heard and seen and that, that there's some value there. And so relationship building is the way to make that happen. It's yes. not, things aren't just, you're not going to win just because you have the best thing, right? You're going to win because you are solving people's three quarter inch hole problems. Yes. Yes. Now, interesting. I mean, you mentioned adoption of technology, which is becoming more and more, I guess, critical and having that uh, mindset and agility. Uh, building a partnership, not just with your 3PL, but with other industry, but also on the on the on the go to market side of things, right? W what do you see in terms of product lines, and you know, analyzing non profit or less profitable products or categories versus you know, make the strong stronger, reduction of SKUs, anything on that aspects that you see happening and probably required to happen. Well, and that, you know, that goes down to that data analytics that I was it's, talking about, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Whether you're, whether you're running your company on spreadsheets or you actually have a solution in place. And even sales mm -hmm. channels like Shopify has a lot of reports or your WMS for your warehouse has reports. You need to take advantage of all of those um, because it's really interesting. You might see a, a SKU that's lower performing. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at your advertising, you realize that you have not shown that SKU in any of your ads. You're showing something that has a brighter color. Right. Okay. And so yeah. maybe just a slight switch in ad spend is going to push that up. You know, maybe your hero skew, you're going to run out of too fast. So you want to reduce your ad spend on that. You want to slow that one down yes. and push the other one back up. So doing that data analytics and figuring mm -hmm. that out rather than just looking at it and going, man, nobody wants this. Um, maybe they don't want it because they don't know. Maybe changing the images on the front of your website. So that one is the first one they see when they get on the website. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so sometimes it's, it requires a little bit of experimentation to figure that out. Yeah. Um, often there are SKUs that just aren't performing or maybe have a bunch of warranty claims on them, mm -hmm. right? Maybe there's a, a production run that just wasn't great. Um, you're better off pulling that and taking the loss up front than continuing to try and push that. However, yeah. you don't have to just throw it away, right? Maybe, maybe it's, maybe there's nothing wrong with it. It's just not as popular. Put it in a bundle. Bundle it with your popular one. Nice. Charge more, and yes. then you've just sold two. Nice. Or three. Yeah. So yeah. there are lots of ways to to mm -hmm. move inventory mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily the one thing at a time. You know, um, if you're doing direct to consumer and your product is pretty popular, think about B two B. Think about okay. selling to to boutique stores and retailers. Launching, you know, launching a little listing and store on Fair mm -hmm. or Brand Boom or mm -hmm. Miracle. 
Um, because there are, yeah. there are ways that you can move higher volume of product. You may get a lower profit margin on those wholesale deals, but you can't look at it that way. You can't say, oh, I make twice as much selling on direct to consumer because if you're selling to target, they're going to buy thousands at a time from you. So yeah. it might be at a lower margin, but mm -hmm. it's thousands at a time. Your customer acquisition cost is much, much lower, right? You're not one, 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 one getting mm -hmm. customers. You're doing a thousand. And yep. then Target has your product on their website or in their stores. And all of a sudden you have brand recognition and that's driving traffic to your website. So I think it's really important that a brand doesn't get super stuck in the mindset of only B2B mm -hmm. retail or only direct to consumer. Yes. Yes. Um, and, and Amazon it, and Temu, I mean, those marketplaces are their own channel, right? I don't think you should look at them like a sales channel. It's, you know, especially Amazon, it's a full circle, right? Full they can circle, ship yeah. it, they can store it, they can sell it, they can market mm -hmm. it, they can... And they're going to charge you 15% to do that. Well, you know, yep. overall, that's pretty small mm -hmm. for the, since they're doing the customer acquisition for you. Yes. And they're providing so, like a one, one click checkout and other fulfillment and people, people trust yeah. them. And so there's a great value, obviously. Yeah. Well, and there's a credibility piece, right? If they yes. hear about you or they see your ad on TikTok or Instagram, mm -hmm. they're, they're probably going to go look and see if you're on Amazon, Amazon. just for yeah. credibility to figure out if you're legitimate or not. Yes. If they see you on Amazon, they're like, ah, oh, okay, it's real. It's legit. It's a, it's a real website. It's not a scam. So yeah. now I can buy this, right? So what would be an ideal process of a brand, you know, go, I mean, going, I mean, launching his business on Amazon. How do you see this process usually taking you know, place? It's actually not that hard. Yeah. Um, it's actually pretty easy to launch. Amazon has made it easy. You know, they have templates mm -hmm. for, for doing your listings and uploading and getting your store. Um, if you have a trademark, patent, copyright, you can get brand protection with Amazon and you can actually have your own store. I don't know if you've ever been on Amazon where you're buying a vacuum from Dyson and it says, go see the Dyson store, right? So you yeah. click on that. It has all their products. Sure. Um, so if you if you can set up that brand registry, then Amazon actually works to protect your product. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work for a company called Final Straw. They make actually have one right here. It's a it's a reusable foldable straw to get rid of single use plastic. It's really cool. Nice. It folds up and uh -huh. goes inside this this little case, um, and then it pops open when wow. you pull out of the case. It's it's Good. awesome. Amazing. Um, and they they were on Amazon, and because that product is patented, there were a lot of people trying to sell a fraudulent copycat of it. Uh -huh. So Amazon protected that company. They actually not only did they take down the fraudulent listings, but they packaged up those fraudulent products and shipped them to us. So we had boxes wow. and boxes and boxes of fraudulent. So they wouldn't send them back to the to the people that were violating the patent. They yes. sent them to us. To you, yeah, amazing. Um, so, you know, Amazon can be a really good tool. It can be a really good partner and it's something you shouldn't be afraid of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And it's anything outside of Amazon that you see evolving in the market? I don't know, TikTok shop you know, or yeah. something on the social side? Uh, well, TikTok's, TikTok's the one everyone's talking about. Um, <laughs> yes. in, Instagram shopping and Facebook shopping are on the rise too. Social shopping, they call it. Yes. Um, yeah. But TikTok is on fire. And mm -hmm. I think that the early adopters, the brands that are getting on now, um, I think they're going to have more opportunity for success on mm -hmm. TikTok because mm -hmm. they're, it's not as crowded a market right now yes. on TikTok. Yes. Um, and especially if you have a product that's extremely visible. So I'm actually in the middle of launching another brand um, mm -hmm. with my, actually with my son-in-law mm -hmm. and it's a product made for toddlers and it's very visual. And so we've talked about yes. that, about the social shopping and especially for the age group of the young parents right now, they're all doing a lot of Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and all Correct. that. So getting getting on that again gives you brand credibility to towards that age group of your market. Yes. Now it's also, you know, that same market is also for the parents of the of the new parents, right? So the grandparents. Mm -hmm. I'll buy I I have a two year old grandson. I'll tell you, I'll buy anything <laughs> for that kid. Anything. <laughs> yeah. So I'll spend any amount of money to to trick things out for him. So, okay. you know, that's something that, that we're gonna target too, but that's a different you have to go to a different place. They're doing different things. They're looking in different places for their products. Yes. I mean, you need to be where your shoppers are spending time, right? And Yep. Meet, I mean, your, meet your customers where they live. Yes. And I mean, we have so many different communities, right? Like in YouTube and you know, Twitch and, and, and Snap and you know, Pinterest and TikTok. I mean, it's very difficult for any marketeer to... Whether you pick, you know, pick your battles, make the strong stronger, and try to win on TikTok, or just spend your budgets across so many channels, 
I guess it's not, uh, there's no easy answer for that, right? It's uh, Well, there's no easy answer on yeah. that sales side. Yeah. And certainly not for me. You'll have to have somebody that is really great at sales um, yeah. on your on your podcast next. Yeah, but, sure, sure. Um, from an operations side, there's a lot you can do once you are at that point where you have all those channels. So mm-hmm. you've probably been hearing the words multi-channel and omni-channel. And people kind of look at them like the same thing and, and use it interchangeable because they don't mm-hmm. understand. Mm-hmm. They are not the same. So multi-channel is what we've been talking about. You have, maybe you have two, three warehouses. Maybe you have, yep. you know, Walmart and Target, and you're on Shopify, and you're on Amazon, and you're on TikTok, and you're on Instagram, and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and everything is disconnected, right? All of it is working, but all by itself. Siloed. Om- yeah. Omni-channel pulls everything together. So you bring in something that's order operations in the center of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I work for a company called Pipe17 that's doing order operations. And so you connect all of those sales channels, your finance channels, your ERP, you connect all of your warehouse channels, and it's all in there together. And what that does is not only give you super great grip on your inventory and what's going on there, Mm -hmm. great reporting and analytics because everything's together. You're not logging into all those different places and pulling reports, but also you can level up. For example, say you're at, say you're in Target. You're selling in Target and you have your own website and you have a customer that had something in their cart that they didn't buy on the website, mm-hmm. but you're using geofencing and they are pulling into the Target parking lot. Mm-hmm. You send them a text message that says, hey, this product that you had in your cart is available in store. <laughs> nice. Omni- that turns it into omni-channel. That That's gives another you- layer. Yeah. Another of layer like of me- online meeting offline, your customers right? where they yeah. are, right? And and yes. online and offline blending yes. is the very best thing you can do. You want them to see your product and target and remember that they left something in their cart, mm-hmm. right? Great you example. You want to put that together. Yes, yes. So speaking about partners and let's talk a little bit about the 3PL and warehouses. I know you believe in you know spending time on warehouses. You know, put your boots on the ground there and go and research. What's the, your your best you know recommendation in terms of selection of three PL partners and in terms of uh, you know selection and you know working with them? Yeah, so I I say never ever ever Google to find your next warehouse uh-huh. because just because they spend a lot of money on ads yeah. doesn't mean they're the right fit for you. Mm-hmm. So there's actually a whole process, and I have I actually have all the tools on my website people can download for free. Um, but you have to identify what you need. You have to figure out your requirements, right? Mm-hmm. So, so it's filling out that scope. How many SKUs do you have? What's the average package size? How much storage space do you need? Are you, is it hazmat or cold chain? Do you need special services? Do you need mm-hmm. kitting and bundling? Um, do you need special, do you need certain integrations? Maybe you are using NetSuite and you, and you, they have to have a NetSuite integration, right? So you need to figure out what your requirements are and what you need, your, your volume, all of it. Um, then you have your scope, right? So you know exactly who you are. Mm-hmm. So now you need to figure out who they are. So you have your whole list of questions for them that are related to your scope. But the how do you find them, right? You've gotten to this point where you have your scope. I've told you not to Google. So now what are you going to do? You're going to network. You're going to talk to every other brand founder that you know, ask mm-hmm. them who they're using, if they like them, join groups on LinkedIn and Facebook and Slack of other brands and learn from other founders and ask mm-hmm. questions. Um, there's fulfill.com, which is a 3PL finder and they're fantastic and they do a really good job to try to match that scope yes. to so yes. that they get the right fit. Mm-hmm. I never, ever, ever want to do an RFP and place somebody with a warehouse and have them come back to me six months later saying they want another one, mm-hmm. right? I want to get it right the first time. Yeah. Um, but it, But it's not just about, okay, so, you know, my guy down the street said, these guys are good. So I'm going to sign on with them. Right. Exactly. No. Yeah. So you take your scope document, you put it out for RFP request for mm-hmm. proposal. So maybe you've picked five or six that you think fit your requirements. Right. So then you ask them all these questions. And then I have this rating rubric that you fill out where you score their answers to all of mm-hmm. your questions. Mm-hmm. And then you get a total at the end for exactly how each one will do on each of the items you've asked about. Yep. Um, pricing is the very last piece that you that you think of or ask. And okay. it drives me nuts when a brand thinks they need to ask, what do you charge for pick and pack? And that's the first question. <laughs> because no one leaves a warehouse because they charged $1.75 for pick back and the guy down the street charges $1.35. 
right? Yeah. They're not going to make the change for that. They're going to make the change for all those other things, the customer service, the SLAs, the integrations, how easy it to work with them. Are they mm-hmm. my, are they my vendor or my partner, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. A, a warehouse that's truly acting as a partner is not going to have their clients leave. So I try and yes. make sure that, that clients get to that partnership place. And, and so the pricing piece, I think there's way too much emphasis put on it because when you boil it all down and if you look at, if you looked at a bunch of invoices from a hundred warehouses and plug them all into an AI, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's probably going to tell you that the variance between warehouses is less than 10% overall. Yeah. yeah. So what's, what's that special sauce? I mean, how do you, you know, analyze, I mean, what are they like, like, you know, the top three, four criteria that you're looking at, you're looking at. Yeah. You know, and, and, I, I look at that partnership. I look at customer service. Are you going to make me okay. put a ticket in or is there mm-hmm. someone I can call? Mm-hmm. Is there someone on the warehouse floor that I can say, hey, can you open up that package? Because I think we might have to do a recall, mm-hmm. right? You want to know that that they are acting in your best interest. And so yes. you want to ask a lot of those questions. What is my access to people? How do you handle problems? Uh, what happens if you don't meet, meet your SLAs? If you're slipping mm-hmm. and not shipping stuff out on time mm-hmm. and it's not my fault, it's your fault. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to fix that for me? Right. Um, Returns. How are you going to handle my returns? Are you going to toss them in a corner and charge me five bucks a piece for them? Or are you going to open them and see if it's new and I could resell it? Mm -hmm. You know, are you going to help me with that? So it's questions like that. It's, it's, are you going to be my partner? Yes. You know, this is again, as we said, it's a theme across the the episode, right? Building partnerships. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. Any, any, I mean, any feedback or, you know, like 3PL versus 4PL, like making those type of decisions? <laughs> that's that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, I, I see a trend more away from 4PLs by brands because okay. they want that, that partnership feeling. Mm-hmm. However, mm-hmm. for some brands, a 4PL is a great fit. So um, for people listening that don't know the difference, so 3PL is, it stands for third party logistics and 4PL means they don't own all of their warehouses. They, they have relationships with warehouses across the country, but they make a software. So yeah. their software is going to pick up your sales channel and push it to the warehouse closest to mm-hmm. your customer. So your product is going to get to the customer faster if you're using a 4PL, most likely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, however, there are drawbacks to the 4PL, right? You don't know where your stuff is. It's, it's distributed. It's spread all over the place. Um, you don't get to talk to people at the warehouse that have your stuff, mm-hmm. right? They're because they are they work for the 4pl right so you talk to the customer service at the 4pl and they'll help so there's layers in there that might be less comfortable Mm -hmm. um it can take a little bit longer to inbound to a 4pl because you'll send your product to maybe their main distribution center and then they will spread it Mm -hmm. so you have to wait until it's received at the final spot before it's it's available to sell so Mm -hmm. You know, there are advantages and disadvantages and it just, it all boils down on what you need. If you're, if you're doing super high volume, have a somewhat low SKU count and you want stuff to your customer the, the next day because you want to compete with what Amazon's doing, a 4PL can be a really good option for you. Interesting. Interesting. So Kathleen, right. It was really, really amazing. I mean, <laughs> it's so great to see your passion and, you know, energy. And obviously your expertise and knowledge in this field. So thank you very much for all the you know exciting value uh, that you provide. Um, you know, this is the time that I must ask you about the scuba diving. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I know you mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, I'm sure, you know, the audience the listeners would love to know more about it. So, you know, it, it, I think I said I posted something last week on Instagram about, or I mean, on LinkedIn about fear. Yeah. I put a picture of a, a shark on there. So mm-hmm. I was afraid of water my whole life. I nearly drowned wow. as a as a little okay. kid. Okay. And so large bodies of water were like the thing that I was like, oh, hell no. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got to a point in my life where it was time to, to start to make changes and face that and not live that way anymore. And so I made a Dang. list of all the things I was afraid of and I was mm-hmm. just going to tackle them and check them off. And, uh, and water was the number one thing. So wow. I took a I took a trip by myself to Hawaii and went to the the concierge desk and I said, okay, never been on a trip alone before, you know, always been with my kids or my family or, Mm -hmm. and so, you know, I want to do things I've never done before and I want to tackle some things I'm afraid of. And so I went through the little book and was like this, 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 
um, I learned to, to surf and I kayaked up wow. to a waterfall and hiked uh-huh. and, and then I learned to dive, which was the biggest because it wasn't just, I wasn't just looking at the water or going on a boat or being in a kayak. I was in it. Um, and it was really scary at first. Yes. And when, it, when we first went in the, I remember in one of my first open dives, um, I was just panicking and I kept popping back. I couldn't even get okay. under and I just was like hyperventilating and I had the mm-hmm. most incredible guide and he grabbed me by the vest and he said, okay, we naturally breathe in, but we don't naturally breathe out. So he said, every time I tap your, your regulator, you breathe out and mm-hmm. don't, don't look away from my eyes and just breathe out when I tap. And so I was like, you know, super scared. So wow. I'm looking at his eyes and then, <laughs> you know, he's tapping and he's, I didn't realize that but he's pushing the button, you know, so, so my air's coming out. So we're going down and then he's yep. tapping and I'm breathing out. And every time I started to look away, he hit my mask <laughs> to remind yeah. me, you know, look at me. Um, and then we were, I'm, I'm going to say we were probably 20, 30 feet down and a turtle was right here going wow. right by me. And uh-huh. I went like this and my eyes were huge and he let me go. And that was it. I was wow. like, soon as I, as soon as I got down there and I could breathe and I could see, and it was, I mean, I've, I've been diving with sharks. I've been diving all over the world. Um, Ooh, and wow. I've seen so many incredible things and it doesn't matter where I dive, even a place, if it's not known for great diving, I'll, I'll dive anyway. Um, yeah. and there's always something to see, something to see. I, I was on one dive where it was so murky. You could hardly see anything, mm-hmm. but you could hear the whales calling to each other wow. under, under under the water. So <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, that was cool. Like very. So cool. there's a, there's always something. There's always an adventure under the water. Amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for yeah. sharing. Anything else you want to add? Uh, you know, be brave. If you're a brand <laughs> and you're growing, be brave. You know, hit those inflection points and make those changes. Um, if you're not a brand but you have an idea, be brave do it Mm -hmm. you have you know you only regret all the shots you don't take right so um and if you're if you're a brand and you're growing and you're hitting all of those inflection points don't be afraid to make to make change you already know in your heart you already know something's wrong you already know something needs to be fixed so be brave enough to fix it yeah yeah maybe call kathleen on the way so (laughs) talk to the expert (laughs) <laughs> yeah and i i put lots of stuff on my website yes sullygarman.com okay. um, lots of lots of tools i i give away a lot of stuff because i figure why not help mm-hmm. um lots of stuff on linkedin so i have lots of you know spreadsheets and tools and ways to organize things and um i'm you know i've been fortunate enough to have the exits that i've had that mm-hmm. um that i can afford to give stuff some stuff away so um i i just want to help Nice, amazing, and we'll put all this detail in the in the show notes. Uh, so, Kathleen, I mean, thank you so much. It was really, really interesting. I enjoyed it so much. Thank you for all the great, you know, energy. Uh, thank we can you feel for it all me. over. It's been fun. Yes, thank you for the passion. Keep educating us, and we'll definitely chat. And hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. I okay. appreciate it. Bye bye. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode. Your support means the world to us. If today's episode has been insightful for you, consider sharing it with someone who would also benefit. Even one share can make a big difference. Looking to elevate your e-commerce game? Discover Vimy, a multi-channel e-commerce platform that will transform your business with the power of shoppable video. Visit us at vimy.net to learn more. It's vimy, V-I-M-M-I dot net. Thank you for being part of our journey. Stay tuned for more invaluable insights in our next episode.